All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Red Tree. So thankful you're here with us this morning and pray uh, God speaks to, uh, to each one of us. I want to start off this morning. I want to think about uh, a moment or a day in your life uh, that you were really looking forward to. Like it was on your calendar and you couldn't, you couldn't wait for that day to come. I think about my life and growing up. I think of graduation day, uh, the day that I no longer had to go to high school ever again. It, it was done. I, I thought about um, the day I got my driver's license and, and the freedom that, that that felt and how great that felt. And I could go uh, wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, uh, with my parents' permission, of course, but, you know, limited freedom. I thought of wedding day that, that we long for, we dream, we, we, we wait, we anticipate that, that wedding day, and then it comes, we, we, we win that big, day, that big game, we get that job, we get that promotion, uh, we get that date. I, I remember when our oldest son, uh, Caleb, he's serving down in kids' ministry this morning, uh, was living in Hawaii, and he had been gone for, for quite a while, and we, he was coming home that night, and we couldn't wait for Caleb to get home, hadn't seen him, missed him. And about 7.30 in the morning, he just walks in the door completely unexpected. We knew that he was coming that day, but we thought it was night. And we walked in at 7.30 in the morning. Just the, just the thrill, just the excitement, something that you were expecting. Uh, but then when it comes, it, it's, it's even better than what you were expected. This Wednesday, I knew that uh, Allison and Easton and Adeline and Ember were driving up from Nashville and going to hang out with us a couple days, and they were going get, to get to our house about 4.30, and so uh, I, I made sure that I left here and was going to get home by about 4.30, and I pulled up the exact same time that they pulled up, and just seeing their car coming down the road and knowing that my grandbabies were in that car and my daughter was in that car, and, and just, I knew it was coming, I knew I was going to see them, but then when I saw them, my heart just leapt, and you, it, it's just an absolute thrill watching Morgan walk down the aisle and watching Patrick waiting for Morgan to walk down the aisle, and the same with Brian and Renata just here within the last few months. You see that, that expectancy, that, that, that thrill. We've been in a series the last a uh, few weeks called Jesus Is, and we've talked about that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is real, that Jesus is 100% man and 100% God, that Jesus is the answer, that Jesus is our example, that Jesus is uh, uh, the good shepherd, he's, he, he's a leader of, of leaders. There's, there, there's so many things we've talked about. We've talked about in this series, the goal is, number one, is just say, thank you, Jesus, you are awesome. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for what you've promised to do. And the second part of that is, uh, Jesus, not only you are awesome, thank you, Jesus. It's, it's Jesus, help us to become more like you. Help us to see people the same way that you see them. Help us to talk like you. Help us to, to think like you. Help us to interact and treat others the same way uh, that you to help us to respond to situations and people the same way uh, that you have done. This morning we're talking about Jesus is coming back. And you want to talk about a day of, of expectation. You want to talk about a day that we know is coming, but when it happens, it's, it's going to so surpass anything we could ever Imagine. I, I thought about showing a video. You guys ever seen the videos um, of like when a soldier's been gone away and, and, and they've come back and you see just the emotion that's, that's in all of that? I thought about showing them, but I, I can't watch like 30 seconds of that without starting to bawl. And to think about someone that we love, someone that has done so much for us, that means so much, that's been away and is coming back, and we're awaiting that from the Son of God and the Savior of the world. 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, Jesus said just uh, to the disciples that were like, hey, when are you coming back? He's like, it's not for you to know the time or the hour, but you are going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon, upon you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses uh, to Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and all to the ends of the earth. And then we pick it up in verse 9. And after Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the skies. He was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So I can only imagine what it was like to be one of his disciples. For, for three years, listening to him and, and watching him and, and seeing him do miracle after miracle after miracle, seeing the, the crowd, seeing the, the, the Pharisees, seeing the, 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 the sinners coming to him, and just all of the busyness that, that, that surrounded everywhere Jesus went. And watching it all, and then Jesus telling them, hey, I just want to give you a heads up. In a few days, I'm going to be handed over, and I'm going to be crucified. But then I'm going to come back again. And I can't imagine what it was like for those disciples that walked with him, that ate with him, that talked with him, that laughed with him, that, that hung out with him for three years. I can't imagine what it was like to watch him be crucified and breathe his last. The, the confusion, the, the, the heartache, the, 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 the questions, the, the doubts. And then three days later to see him again. And to see the hands in his, the, the holes in his hands and his feet and, and to interact with him and eat breakfast with him and, and, and to talk with him and, and then to watch him, your best friend, the, the guy you've hung out for the last three years, the guy that you've seen do things that, that no one could do without God, watch him ascend into the clouds. And they're just staring there. And I imagine their, their jaws have hit the floor. And two angels show up and say, say, why are you staring into the clouds? Don't you know that he's coming back again in the same way that he left? John chapter 14, verse 1, who have just, uh, it seems like I've been to, to, to several funerals here uh, lately and... Um, and these verses have just meant so much to me uh, just these last few months, just especially so. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus is talking to his disciples. says, do not let your hearts be troubled. For even if we just stopped there, just to know that Jesus, the, the ruler of the universe, the king that's above every king, our best friend, our savior, says to us, Hey, you know what? Do you have stuff going on in your life? Sometimes would trouble be an accurate example for the emotions that you're feeling? Whether things at, at home or at work or with our finances or our country or, or just whatever. Do you ever feel troubled? Jesus, I, I love this. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my father's house... There's many rooms, and that word rooms literally means dwelling spaces. I love the King James Version where it talks, in, there's many mansions. Like, if I have a choice of having a room or a mansion, I'm going with a mansion. In my father's house, there's many rooms, many mansions, many dwelling places. If that were not so... Would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. Again, Jesus is ready to go to the cross. It's just days ahead of him. And he is preparing and he's warning and he's instructing his disciples. Same for us. He says, I want you to know, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm getting ready to leave you, but understand when I leave you, I am going ahead of you to my father's house, and I'm preparing a place with your name on it, a place that belongs to you, so that where I am in heaven, you will be also for all of eternity. You believe in God, that's awesome. Believe also in me. Trust me, Jesus is saying. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you to be with me forever. Revelation chapter 21, we get a glimpse of heaven. The John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, was in exile on the island of Patmos, and God gives him a vision of the end times in heaven. Uh, we read uh, about it in part of it, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So we see this glimpse of heaven. That God is on the throne. And God has promised us that if we have given our lives to us, that we've trusted Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave for atonement for our sin and receive the gift of forgiveness and cleansing and salvation. That we will be with him forever in his home heaven. And there God's going to wipe away every tear. And in heaven, there's, there's, there's no such thing as, as death. There's no such thing as mourning. There's no such thing as crying or, or, or pain. For, for the old order of things have passed away, and he's making all things new. And he tells John, write these things down. They are trustworthy, and they are true. And as we continue through the rest of the chapter, we're going to Read about different things as it describes heaven. In Revelation 21, verse 11, it says, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Verse 8, The wall was made of jasper. The city was made of pure gold, as pure as glass. Verse 19, it talks about the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone, jasper and sapphire, ruby, emerald. Verse 21, it says, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, and each gate made of a single pearl, and the great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And then in verse 22, it says, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nation will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And on no day will its gate ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it, and nothing impure will ever enter into it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so in this, in this vision that John has of, of heaven, he sees 
this, this city that is beyond beautiful. It's brilliant, it's glorious, it's, it's majestic. The, 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 the streets are made of gold, the, the, the gates are made out of pearls, the walls uh, are made out of precious jewels. That heaven is filled with the glory of God, it's brilliant with beauty, and, and there's nothing impure there. It's perfection, it's beauty, it's brilliance. And it's home. It's our home. That if we have trusted Jesus, that's our home. There's no need for a sun there. There's no need for a light there. Because There's no need for a temple there. Because God himself is there. And just as though we see each other this morning... One day, we're going to see him. Just as we gather this morning to, 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 to sing to him and to worship him and to hear from him, one day, we're going to see him face to face. And we're going to fall at his feet. And we're going to sing directly to him. And we're going to hear directly from his voice. This is the reality that is awaiting us. Our home will be heaven. Caleb and Luke moved out a little bit ago and got an apartment with Eli, and I've been to their apartment, and it's awesome. It is great. It is, it, it's really nice. Luke and Allison have, have a house in Nashville and been to their house and love their house, one of my favorite places in the world to go. Uh, it, it, it's... It's great. Ben and Caitlin, you guys have a house, right? I've been to, been to your house. Some of you guys have a house or apartment or, or a dwelling place, okay? We know what our homes look like. In, in, in the dark, depending on what was left on the floor, we could probably navigate through our house cautiously, maybe. Depends on how many kids you have. You can <laughs> Salome is the champ at that. <laughs> but the home we're living in now, it's temporary. It's just our address for a little bit. This earth is not our home. We have a home that has been and is being prepared for us. And that's where we belong. And that's where we'll be forever. And Jesus is coming back. His words are trustworthy and true. He has promised, if I go and I leave you, just know when I've gone, what I'm doing is I'm preparing a place for you. And I'm coming back for you. And I'm going to take you to your home with me for all of eternity. Jesus is coming back. Doesn't just the mere thought of that, the reflection of that, just get us a little excited? That, it, that it's so much better than we could ever describe or picture or, or imagine, but it's reality. It's just waiting on us in our time that God has appointed for us to go be with him f- forever. <coughs> so it, it kind of begs the couple questions in, in my mind. Question number one is this. If everybody wants to go to heaven then how come nobody wants to die? The famous theologian, B.B. King, and if you're younger than me, B.B. King was a famous musician, said everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die to get there. Kenny Chesney, George Strait, Albert King, David Crowder, all have songs, everybody wants to go to heaven, but 
Nobody wants to die. David Crowder's even got a book titled, Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven and Nobody Wants to Die. Too often people want to go to heaven, but not yet. That there's things on, on earth we're not ready to leave or, or, or we want to experience and we haven't experienced it, 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 it yet. And honestly, that just, it just shows us our, our limited understanding of heaven and our home, of reality and of, of life. So question number one is, if everybody wants to go to heaven, how, then why does nobody want to die? Question number two is, okay, if Jesus is coming back, when? When, when is that happening? When, when Jesus ascended into the clouds in Acts chapter 1, that, that was almost 2,000 years ago. When, when, when is he coming back? Well, Peter talks about this question in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 3. Above all, Peter writes, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestor died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning. So, so Peter's writing to his readers, hey, hey, understand this. In the last days, just understand this. Scoffers are going to come, and this is what scoffers do. They scoff. They, they belittle. They, 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 they make fun of. They, 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 they question they will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. Don't be surprised, Peter says, that in the last days, scoffers are going to come, and they're going to follow their own evil desires, and they're going to mock us. They're going to scoff and say, where is this coming? You know, you keep talking about it, but, but ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on like it always has. Where is this coming? Verse 8, Peter responds, but, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. God's, God's got a different timeline than we do. He's got a different time understanding than we do. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day to him. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with us not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So, so Peter tells us, hey, hey, just be forewarned. Know this, scoffers are going to come. They're going to mock the return of Jesus. They're going to mock God. They're going to question God. They're going to belittle God. They're going to make fun of you for following. You're going to talk about Jesus coming, coming again. Yeah, right, when? It's been 2,000 years. Peter warns him, don't get misled. God's timeline is different than our timeline. And don't think he's slow. He's loving. Don't, don't think he's forgotten. He's patient. Don't think he's not going to do it. It's his desire for everyone to come to repentance and to not perish. Peter addresses the question, when, when is it going to happen? Paul addresses the question, 1 Thessalonians 5, and these are just short glimpses, there's so many more. Paul writes in 1 Thess Thessalonians 5, 1, Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So, so the believers in the city of Thessalonica are asking, they're wondering, when is it going to happen? Tell us, when's it going to happen? Paul reminds them, it, it, it's, we don't know. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour. It's going to be like a thief coming in the middle of the night. It's going to happen when we are not expecting it. The disciples asked Jesus this same question. How, how, how do we know? When, when's this going to happen? In Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they, they said, tell us, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of age? 
Again, these are moments before Jesus is going to the cross. And he's teaching them and, and warning them and instructing them and encouraging them. And they're like, Jesus, tell us, when is it going to happen? We've been waiting for the Messiah. <coughs> we believe you're the one. We thought you were going to come and you were going to reign and you were going to de- defeat the, the Romans and we're going to rule with you. We, we thought it, but when is it going to ha- come? When, when is your... When is it going to happen in the end of the age? And Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, And kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And these are the beginnings of the birth pains. So Jesus compares it to to going through labor. We were so excited for Andrew and Camille this week welcoming baby Callie. And uh, thank you for the prayers for uh, for all of them. And uh, they're doing doing well and just uh, enjoying one another. But I've never been through labor. I've seen it my fair share of times. I'll take my side of the hospital room in that whole situation. I think, guys, I think we got it pretty good. Jesus is pointing to signs saying, these are the beginning of the labor pains. It's not yet, but it's the beginning of the, uh, of the process. Well, and, and don't be deceived. Watch out. There's going to be people coming, claiming to be messiahs that are not messiahs. They're going to ask you to follow them. They're not the ones to follow Jesus as I am. There's going to be wars and, and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famines. Those are just the beginning of the labor pains in the process of, of my return. Verse 9. Then you, disciples, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. You want to know what precedes the the, the end coming? It's this. People are going to hate you for following Jesus. People will betray you. They will lie about you. They will persecute you. And they will put you to death. Now here in America, uh, we we may experience a little of the scoffing. But but we have so much freedom that the the world does not have. And there are believers just like us around the world in prison right now because of their faith in Jesus. There are families just like our family that have lost loved ones because of no other reason, because they were a follower and believer in Jesus. The the Bible says that that people will think they're doing God a favor. They're pleasing God by eliminating and killing us. Jesus said, this is part of the process. Just know when the end comes, here's some of the things that are going to happen. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. They will say things that that sound good, but but don't completely line up with the Bible. They'll they'll say things that that, that sound enticing and attractive and and meets what our flesh desires, but doesn't necessarily match up with what the Bible says. There'll be false religions. There'll be false teachers. There'll be false messiahs. Know that they are coming and know this, that as time passes, wickedness is going to increase 
and love is going to decrease. And then, when, when the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what Jesus has offered and what Jesus has done on our behalf, when the good news goes to the, 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 the whole world, the, all of the, the, the people groups, then the end will come. Verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not, not take place in the winter on the Sabbath or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. For if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So Jesus says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, run. Don't don't go out of the field to grab anything. Don't go back to the house. Don't go to the roof. Don't go down. Just run. Run. When this happens, there will be time of great persecution, uh, unequal to what there ever has been or, or will be. And if it were not cut short in mercy, no one would survive. So, so the question is, what is the abomination that causes desolation? Well, the word abomination means something that is detestable or, or filthy or, or loathsome. The word desolation means to destroy or to lay waste or to to devastate. So Jesus is talking about something that is detestable and is filthy that is going to cause and bring destruction. When you see this happening, run. He refers to the prophecy that Daniel had in Daniel chapters 11 and 12. And in Daniel's time, Daniel was prophesying about the coming Greek king and Antiochus Epiphanes, though, though he, that was not his given name, that was not his birth name, but that is the name that he went by. And you want to talk about having some confidence? His name meant manifestation of God. And he said, this is, my, this is, this is the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes saying, I am the manifestation of God in front of you. I am God is what he was declaring. And during his reign, he stopped the daily worship and sacrifices in the Jewish temple. He took a pig, which is an unclean animal that that the Jewish people are to have nothing with it, and sacrificed it on the altar that belonged to God, completely scoffing and mocking the, the, the worship in that culture in that time. And then he took a statue of the Greek god Zeus. And put it in the temple of God. That was the abomination that caused desolation. That, that fulfilled the, the, the prophecy of, of, of Daniel. Now there's different views on the return of, of Jesus. There's, uh, there's a, a pre-tribulation rapture. That before these things happen, God's going to come as people. Tell him to take his people. He's going to take us to heaven. And we're going to miss out on that great persecution. That will only be for uh, Jewish people that become believers after the, the rapture. So other people believe in a, a, a mid-trib revelation. In the middle of the tribulation, uh, that's when Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take his people there. Other people believe in a, a post-trib. There's also a, a, a preterist view of, of this and a futurist view. The preterist view, preterist means past. And so in, in A.D. 70, in A.D. 70, the Romans under Titus came and destroyed the temple and destroyed the altar. And so uh, certainly that was an abomination that caused desolation. Great persecution broke out. And so the preterist view would say what happened in 70 AD, that is what Jesus is talking about in this situation. The futurist view says, yes, that happened, but Jesus is still pointing to something that's yet to happen. That will likely be that, that in Jerusalem, that, that, that the temple would be rebuilt and that something that is detestable and dishonoring 
uh, and loathsome to God will, will, will then take place in that temple. That's a uh, and great persecution is going to take place from there. That's a futurist view. Verse 23, at, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs, false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, even if possible, the elect. See, I've told you ahead of time, so if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out, or here he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as lightning that comes in the east is visible even in the west, so it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus says false messiahs are going to come, false teachers are going to come, false prophets are going to come. When Jesus came the first time, he was born in a manger in, in Bethlehem and few noticed. The shepherds were invited in, the, the wise men saw the star. But for the most part, when Jesus came the first time, it was in silence and obscurity. Jesus says, when I come back again, it's just like if you're outside and you see lightning in the east, you can view it in the west. That when I come back again, there's going to be no doubt that it's me and that I'm coming and that I'm here and what's happening. Verse 28, where there is a carcass, the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man of heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So Jesus is, is we're getting a glimpse here of, of what it will look like um, when, when Jesus comes. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, heavenly bodies will be shaken, the angels will come and gather the elect. Verse 36, but at, about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the, son, uh, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and up until the day Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. Jesus says, when I come back, it's going to be the same as when Noah was building the ark. And people were just going around with, with, their, with, with their daily life. That they ignored the warnings of the coming judgment. People were eating, drinking. People were, were, were getting married. That they were living as though with no expectation of what was about to happen. Jesus says, when I come back again, it's going to be just like the time of Noah. That, 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 there's, that there's no, uh, no expectation that, that, that when he comes back, no one knows the day or the hour. Then he goes on to say, not everyone will be taken to heaven. He says, be ready, for we, never, we do not know the hour. And then he goes on, and the rest of 24 and 25 uh, continues to teach about being ready and tells different parables about the talents and the, the, the virgins and the, the sheep and the goats and the wise and the wicked servants. So here we are. We've read the words of John, the words of Peter, the words of Paul, the words of, uh, of Jesus. All promising us, all encouraging us, all warning us, Jesus is going to come back at any moment. And it's going to happen when, when, when we aren't expecting it. So how should we respond? What should we do? Number one, two things. Number one is this. Don't be deceived and don't be distracted. Don't be deceived and don't be distracted. 
What do you think Satan's goal for us is? To deceive us and to distract us. And I'd say he's, he's doing a pretty good job. Don't be deceived. Jesus is coming back. Don't be distracted. Jesus is coming back. I encourage you, if we had time, we'd read through the rest of 24 and 25. I encourage you to do it on your own and just, just read about the stories that, that, that Jesus is telling to, to, to warn us and encourage us. Be ready. Don't be deceived. Don't be distracted. That we're going to face wickedness. We're going to face diminished love in the world. We're going to face false teachers. We're going to face scoffers. We're going to face people claiming to be the Messiah. False religions. We're going to face all of these attacks, all of these lies that are from Satan with the purpose of to deceive everyone about the truth and reality of who God is, of who Jesus is, and what's going to happen. Scoffers will mock us. They will belittle us. They will make fun of us. We will be thrown into prison. We will be executed. False teachers are are going to come, and they're going to have attractive teaching that sounds good and, and sounds enticing and sounds spiritual, but it's not true. It's not reality. It's not scripture. It's not Jesus. The best way to, to not be deceived, so if you work at a, at, at a bank, you need to learn to identify counterfeit money. Somebody comes in and they're giving you counterfeit money, you need to be able to identify, hey, this isn't the real thing. And, and so what they do in, in the training process is they don't show you, hey, here's a thousand different ways that, that, that people can produce a counterfeit. Watch out for these a thousand different ways. No. What they do is they train you to know the real thing so well that if something comes in that doesn't match up to the real thing, you spot it instantly. And as we're faced with the deception of of the world, of Satan, the best thing that we can do is know the truth of God's word so well so that when somebody says something, you're like, I don't think that lines up with what Jesus said. That that sounds different than than what I read in my Bible. The, The God they're talking about, that's not the God of the Bible. The the God that, that they have in mind, yeah, that may have a peace of the God in Scripture, but it's just a piece. It's not, it's not who God has revealed himself to be in Scripture. Just know that, that, that we're living in, in a, a time and day where Satan's goal is deception. He did it to Adam and Eve. If you, if you, like we're Adam and Eve, they're living in the Garden of Eden. They have everything they could ever dream of. God is there face to face. They're walking with him. They're talking to him. They're interacting with him. What could be better? What could be more clear? How in the world could you listen to Satan o- over God? How in the world? The same deception that leads us astray today. Satan is a master deceiver, and his goal is to deceive as many as he can deceive and to distract us as much as he can so that we are consumed, we are living our lives, we are investing, we're we're pouring everything of our lives into things that don't matter, things that won't last, things of little to no value. When we've been given a, 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 the truth, when we've been given a, a mission, when we've been given a calling to point people to him in his return, to prepare people. Don't be deceived. Don't be distracted. Number two, live ready 
and live expectant. Expect Jesus is coming back. Expect that our home is in heaven. That's where we belong, and it's waiting on us. Expect the victory that Jesus is bringing. Expect persecution. Expect scoffing. Expect the love of many to grow cold. Expect wickedness to increase. Expect the abomination that causes desolation. Expect people to worship things other than God. Expect people to put things in the place that only belongs to God. Expect people to be to do filthy and detestable things. Expect scoffers, and expect Jesus can return at any moment. In the twinkling of an eye, like a thief in the night. And so the question for us is this: Number one, are you ready? Are you ready? I promise you, Jesus' words are trustworthy and true. And Jesus said that he's coming back and nobody knows the day, nobody knows the hour, nobody knows when. So the first question that I I beg you to, to, to answer is, are you ready for Jesus to come back? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you said, Jesus, I believe in you, you are God's son, that you, that you came and you, you lived on this earth, that you were tempted in every way, but you never sinned, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin, death, and hell, that you ascended to heaven and you're coming back again? Have you given your life to Jesus? If Jesus were to come back today, I loved it last week, uh, Solomon, Solomon kind of interacted with me just a little bit, and we talked about, hey, next week we're talking about Jesus is, is coming back, and, and I forget how I worded it, but it was something like, we're not, I'm not saying that Jesus is coming back this week, but he might come back this week. That would be awesome. That would be great. Okay, well, Jesus didn't come back last week. But he might come back this week. He might come back tomorrow. So what is it, if you knew, if you knew that Jesus was coming back in two weeks or two years, what would you do? Let's do that. What what, what sin would we get, get rid of? How would we invest our finances? How would we spend our time? Who is it that that if you knew Jesus was coming back in two weeks, you would make sure that you would meet with them or talk with them over the next two weeks to tell them about who Jesus is and and the second coming of Christ? We need to live ready because we don't know when it's going to be. We need to live ready and live expectantly. We need to expect that not everyone is going to go to heaven. God has given us the mission to share the good news that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, and he offers them forgiveness and salvation in heaven and so much more. God is waiting for the world to hear. So once the, well, once the good news goes to the whole world, to, to all the people groups, then the, then the end will come. Today there are 1 billion people living in 3,700 plus language groups with no access to the Bible. If we're longing for Jesus to return, one of the things that we can do is invest our, our, our resources it's a ministry called the 12 Verse Challenge that, that, that their goal is to, to, to have a translation of, of uh, portions of the Bible into every language within our lifetime. And one of the days that, that, that we can invest our resources is to, is to be a part of that 12 Verse Challenge. I encourage you to, to Google that and to, and to support that. To take the good news to the ends of the earth... 
to the people right next to us. So really, two questions. Are you ready? And if you knew Jesus was coming back in two weeks, what would we do differently? Let's do that now. Let's pray.